but it's going to cause a lot of conflicts in Europe, especially in this country right here. The Holy Roman Empire. At the middle of, of, the, of Europe, is Central Europe, is a empire called the Holy Roman Empire. Today, that will be Germany. The Holy Roman Empire, as you can see, is a huge empire encompassing most of Central Europe and Northern Italy as well. It's bigger than France, it's bigger than Spain, it's bigger than England. This is where the Protestant Reformation is going to take hold. But despite how it looks, the Holy Roman Empire was not that powerful. It didn't actually look like this. Germany was not one country back then. It was more like this tiny, independent, Germanic states, making their own rules, making their own laws, governing themselves. What kind of structure did the Holy Roman Empire have? A decentralized structure. So the Holy Roman Empire is actually just a collection of independent Germanic states that made their own rules, that made their own laws. It's true that they did have one emperor. However, that emperor had very little control over these independent Germanic states. The Holy Roman Emperor is kind of special. It's kind of unique in Europe in that the Holy Roman Emperor was not a hereditary position. Instead, it was an elected position. The leaders of each one of these tiny little independent Germanic states were called prince. So if you're a leader of a state, however tiny, it could be that tiny right there, you're known as a prince, elector, and you get a vote on who will become the next Holy Roman Emperor. Whoever wins will become the emperor for his lifetime. When he dies, his son doesn't automatically take his place. Instead, they have another election. And that's when they select the Holy Roman Emperor. German history is often a history of a struggle between the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and these independent states. These states want to maintain their own independence. They want to maintain control and power while the Holy Old Roman Emperor wants to centralize power in Germany within himself. And that tug of war of power is what German history is mostly going to be about for centuries. But back then, there was no such thing as Germany. It was the Holy Roman Empire. It wasn't much of an empire. It was a collection of tiny little independent Germanic states. Any questions? This is where the Protestant Reformation is going to spread like wildfire. Martin Luther was a German priest. He was from here. So when the Protestant Reformation started, this is where it's going to spread. This is the epicenter of the revolt against the Catholic Church. All right. Let's fill this out. During this period of time, the Holy Roman Emperor was one of the most powerful monarchs in Europe. His name was Charles V. Charles V was not only the Roman Emperor, he was also the King of Spain which gave him a lot of power and authority. Charles V is a well-known figure in European history. When you guys take your European history course in your senior year, you're gonna hear about a lot about him. This is Charles V. Charles V is from the Habsburg family, one of the most powerful families in Europe, and they're going to be kings and queens of Europe eventually. It's notable, the Habsburg are notable for the Habsburg draw. Um, royal families in Europe, they intermarried one another, so they passed on certain physical traits, and sometimes they pass on diseases and genetic conditions as well, because cousins are marrying cousins, very related in their um, DNA and their genetic makeup, including that Habsburg jawline that you see there. But during this time, he is the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Charles V saw himself as the defender of Catholicism, he was a devout Catholic, and he saw himself as the defender of Roman Catholicism. He was very much buddy-buddy with the Pope. And what he's seeing in the Holy Roman Empire is not something that he's liking. The Protestant Reformation is spreading through the states within the Holy Roman Empire. These tiny little states, one by one, are becoming Protestant states instead of Catholic. They're moving away from the Catholic Church. And Charles V did not like that. This differences between the Protestants and Catholics within the Holy Roman Empire will lead to conflict. 
it would lead to a civil war within the Holy Roman Empire itself, where you have Protestant Germans and Catholic Germans going at each other. And this isn't like Muslims against Christians, right? This is Christians against Christians, and the differences between the two, in hindsight, is very minimal, but a lot of people will die. This is why Martin Luther thought that what he started got away from him a little bit, because a lot of people will die because of these religious conflicts. Finally, the, when the war ended and the dust settled down in the Holy Roman Empire, they decided to agree on a peace treaty called the Peace of Augsburg. The peace of Augsburg was signed in 1555. So here's what they decided in Germany, in the Holy Roman Empire. German states will be able to decide for themselves what religion will be practiced in that state. So the leaders of each one of these tiny little German states can determine for themselves which religion will be practiced in their domain. Not all religions, they have two choices. Lutheran or Catholic. So each one of these Germanic states, their leaders get to decide what religion will be practiced in their domain. And then the other religion will kind of be banned in that state. They have two choices, Lutheran or Catholic. The inhabitants of a state, if they want to continue living there, they have to convert to that particular religion. So let's say I'm the ruler of this state in Germany, my tiny little piece of Germany. I'm a Catholic, and some of you all are Protestants. If you want to keep living in this state, you're going to have to convert to my religion. The saying was, his realm, his religion. So whatever religion the ruler has, it will be the religion of his entire domain, his entire state, his entire um, realm. Does anybody have any questions? What if I'm Catholic, right? You're supposed to be all Catholic. What if you're a Protestant and you don't want to be Catholic? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to move. You're going to have to move to a state that practices Protestantism, that practices Lutheranism. So those who refuse have the option to move to a state that practices their religion. At the end of it all, this is what the Holy Roman Empire looked like. The red ones, the red states right here, are Protestant or Lutheran states, and the blue ones are Catholic states. So they get to choose. And for a while, this arrangement worked well in the Holy Roman Empire. There was peace, there's stability, and there's harmony between Catholics and Protestants for a little while. However, this will be short-lived, and we'll talk about why later on. So this is the Peace of Augsburg, his realm, his religion. That's the phrase I want you to remember so that you know what it's about. All right, let's go to France. In France, there was also religious tensions started by the Protestant Reformation, but it's a conflict between the religiously dominant Catholics in France and a Protestant minority group in France. What do we call them? Calvinists in France, what do we call them? Huguenots. So you have Catholics and Huguenots going at each other. Again, the primary religion, the dominant religion is Catholicism, but there were a sizable Huguenot minority in France at the time. So this differences will cause conflict between the two religions until a special king became the king of France. His name is Henry IV. What makes him special? Henry IV, unlike most of the French monarchs, was raised a Protestant. He was raised a Huguenot. He was raised a Calvinist. But eventually, he converted, once he became the king of France, he converted to Catholicism, just so that he's practicing the same religion as the majority of his subjects, which most of France was Catholic at the time. So, being a part of both sides, right, being raised a Protestant and now becoming Catholic, um, he instituted a policy of religious tolerance between the two. So he signed the, the Edict of Nantes. The Edict of Nantes says that Huguenots and Catholics are free to practice their religion in France. There's going to be religious tolerance as long as you're a Huguenot or a Catholic living in France. You will be protected from religious persecution as long as you're a Calvinist Huguenot or a Catholic. So that worked for a while in France. 
that settled down the conflict, that settled down the tensions between the religious groups, until the greatest king in French history became king, Louis XIV, also known as the what? The Sun King. We talked about the Sun King before, and the Palace of Versailles. The Sun King will revoke the, the edict of Nantes. Revoke means he will cancel it. So when he came to power, when he became the king of France, he will cancel the edict of Nantes, which means which religion is banned again in France? The Huguenots are banned again. They're not free to exercise their beliefs, and this will lead to continued conflicts between the Huguenots and the Catholics again. A renewal of these conflicts. And a lot of these Huguenots are going to realize, hey, we're not welcome here. The king doesn't like us. We're being persecuted. So there's going to be a massive immigration away from France by this Huguenot minority. So a lot of these Huguenot Calvinists are going to leave France so that they can practice their religion freely somewhere else. But when a huge group of people leave, not only are they bringing themselves and their families with them, they're bringing their skills, they're bringing their knowledge. A lot of these Huguenots were artisans, they were craftsmen. So a lot of these are going to be lost in France. This is called a brain drain for skills. Um, and knowledge are being lost in a country because they're, be, they're moving somewhere else. So this is gonna cause some conflict in France in a little bit. All right, let's go back. It led to continued conflicts between the Huguenots and the Catholics. All right, let's go back to the Holy Roman Empire. Let's go back to Germany. And we see one of the most important conflicts in European history. Senior year, you guys are going to talk about this more in depth, the Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War, make no mistake about it, there are many different reasons for it, but it's primarily a religious conflict between Protestants and Catholics again. This is a religious conflict that engulfed most of Europe. Most of Europe was involved in this war. But it started in the Holy Roman Empire. Today, what do we call the Holy Roman Empire? What is the Holy Roman Empire today? Germany, very good. So it started in the Holy Roman Empire, what we call today as Germany. And you can probably imagine what's the, what's the reason for this. A new Holy Roman Emperor came to power. I think his name is Philip II. His name is not important. What he did was important. He wanted to impose Catholicism again in the Holy Roman Empire. The problem is, you got the Peace of Augsburg, and some of these German states are already practicing Protestantism. And you have an emperor who wanted Catholicism to be the religion of his empire. So when you have that, you get religious conflict again. So Protestants versus Catholic again. But this is gonna bring in a lot of the other European powers like Spain and Sweden are gonna join in and try to interfere in the conflict. This is like it says, a three decade long war that's gonna bring famine, disease, a lot of death in Europe, especially in Germany. Um, it is estimated that 20% of Germany lost, they lost 20% of the population in Germany because of this conflict. So it'd be like a fifth of Americans vanishing. It costs about eight million lives. This is a truly tragic conflict, but again, it's a religious conflict between Christians. All right, like the previous conflict, it was settled by a treaty. This is called the Peace of Westphalia. So the German states got together, the Protestant ones and the Catholic ones, and they decided, hey, enough is enough, too much suffering, too much death, let's go ahead and sign a treaty. So they said, that in the, Ro the Holy Roman Empire, each German state are gonna be allowed to choose between three religions. First, Roman what? Roman, Roman Catholicism, so Catholic, Roman Catholic. What does the L stand for? Mm -hmm. Lutheran, you can be a Lutheran state. The three, it was a C stand for Calvinist. Calvinist. So you can be Catholic, you can be a Calvinist, or you can be a Lutheran. What does that sound like to you? France. Is right in France. What else is it? Um, 
tolerance, yes. Guys, this is the exact, almost the exact same arrangement as it was before the Thirty Years' War. In the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, each state was allowed to practice whatever religion the ruler had. It's the same thing. It kind of reset the Holy Roman Empire. But for this reset, eight million people died just to bring back Germany to the way it was before the Thirty Years' War. So you're going to see a lot of these human conflicts that we're going to be talking about in class, right? A lot of them are meaningless, ultimately, right? But a lot of people are going to die because of it. So the Peace of Westphalia is almost exactly the same as the Peace of Augsburg, the way Germany was before. All right, moving on. It granted more autonomy, more independence for German states. So these tiny little Germanic states became more independent from the Holy Roman Emperor. The Holy Roman Emperor lost more power. So Germany became more decentralized. Two German states in particular are going to begin to assert themselves and assert their power even further. Those of you that read, which are the two German states that became more powerful after the Thirty Years' War? Russia and Austria. So you got Prussia. Austria. The larger German state in the Holy Roman Empire is the state of Austria, look how big it is, right? And you got Prussia as well over here becoming more dominant and becoming more powerful. Now why do I talk about this, right? Because these are the two states that are going to be competing in Germany, competing in the Holy Roman Empire to unite the German states under one government, under one state. Anybody know, those of you that study history, which of those two German states will manage to unite all of these German states under one country? It will be Prussia. That's why today we have a country that's called Germany. It's because one of these states won out and they were able to unite all of these Germanic states. Prussia, after the war, will develop a very powerful military. So due to the lessons of the war, Prussia will develop one of the most powerful militaries on the planet. Even though Prussia is not as big as England, Spain, or France, Prussia's military will be one of the most formidable in the world, especially their infantry. And this military will eventually unite all the German states together and create the German Empire. But we'll talk about that later on. That happened in the 1800s. We're not there yet. They will, this military will eventually unite all the German states. Let's go to Russia, let's go to the East. What's the dominant religion in Russia? The Eastern Orthodox Church, very good. The Orthodox Church united the Russian people. Religion being used as a uniting influence, as a uniting force to unite a people. That's almost the same across the world. The Russian czars, just like Western European kings, they claim divine right that their authority comes from a god, and that's supported by the Orthodox Church. Again, giving them legitimacy, giving them control. The most influential czar in Russian history is Peter the Great. He tried to reform Russia, modernize Russia, and not only did he reform the Russian government and the Russian military, he tried to reform the Russian Eastern Orthodox Church. He wanted more control over the church, so he imposed some reforms, some changes, the church, including raising the minimum age of clergymen. Clergymen are basically priests. They can be Eastern Orthodox priests, like in this case, or Catholic priests, for example. He raised the minimum age to 50. So if you wanted to be a priest in the Eastern Orthodox Church under Peter the Great's rule, you need to be at least 50 years old. The idea is he doesn't want young people going to the church right away. He wanted them to serve the Russian military first. All right, next. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, there is a leader known as the Patriarch. The Patriarch is kind of like their version of the Catholic what? The Catholic Pope, very good. So he's kind of like a Pope in Roman Catholicism. You know, the great thought that the Patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church had too much power, had too much influence. So during his reign, he removed that position. 
he removed that position. So he abolished the position of patriarch. Instead, to replace it, he formed a council of religious leaders called the Holy Synod. These are a council of religious leaders in the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Holy Synod. And at the head of this council, as their leader, he put himself as the head of the Holy Synod. What does that sound like to you? It's kind of like Henry VIII and what he did with the Anglican Church, right? He, he broke away from the Catholic Church, founded his own religion, and put himself on top of the Anglican Church. It's pretty much the same thing. He removed the Pope version of the Eastern Orthodox Church and put himself on top instead, further centralizing power within himself. He gave himself more power. So now Peter the Great not only has military and governmental powers, he also has religious authority as well. These religious reforms were now well received, especially by the church. They did not like a lot of these changes. It was not well received. But it highlights the tensions that happened in Russia with Peter the Great's efforts to reform Russia, to change Russia, and the church. Whenever Peter the Great tries to change Russia, there's always opposition from the church. Does the church want to maintain the way things are, the status quo? Let's talk about Islam. In Islam, just like in Christianity, there are major differences, major, major schisms and divides. What is the major difference in Islam? What's the major divide in Islam? Between what and what? Between Sunni, whoever said that, and Shia. The question is, who should receive the caliph, the caliphate? Who should become the next caliph? Some people believe that it should be passed on through Muhammad's blood. That would be the Shia Muslims, and some believe that that position should be an elected position. That would be the Sunni sect of, of Islam. In the Ottoman Empire, a Muslim empire, what's the dominant religion in the Ottoman Empire? Sunni Islam. Not just Islam, but specifically Sunni Islam. Even today, in this part of the Middle East, where the Ottomans used to rule, Sunni Islam is still the dominant sect of Islam. Now, the Ottoman Empire conquered Christian territories, especially from the Byzantines, so a lot of these territories converted to Islam, replacing Christianity. So, in a lot of the former Byzantine territories that the Ottoman Empire conquered, like in Greece, for example, the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire converted a lot of these people to Islam to replace Christianity. In the Ottoman Empire, just like some Muslim countries today, um, they use their religious laws to become their legal laws. What do we call the Islamic religious law? Sharia law. Make sure you remember that, Sharia law. Unlike in the United States, where we have a separation between church and state, Christian laws are not necessarily our government laws. They're different from each other, they're separated. In much of the Muslim world, including the Ottoman Empire back then, they're one and the same. All right, let's go to the Safavid Empire. If the Ottomans were Sunni, the Safavids were Shia. Even today, Iran is the home of most of the Shia Muslims in the world. This will cause tensions between the Ottoman Empire and the Safavid Empire. The Ottomans are the defenders of Sunni Islam, and the Safavids are the defenders of Shia Islam. And if we connect it to the modern world, the two countries that are right here bordering one another today are Iran, and next to them is Iraq. The Iraqis are mostly Sunni, and the Iranians are mostly Shia, and they often have conflict the two because of those religious differences. They went to war with, another, with one another a couple of times in modern history because of those religious differences. So the rivalry between the Safavids and the Ottomans are still well and alive today. All right, let's talk about the last gunpowder empire. That would be the Mughals in India. The greatest um, sultan in Mughal history is Akbar the Great. India, during Mughal rule, was a very religiously diverse place. Most of the population is Hindu, but there were some Muslims, like the leaders of the Mughal Empire, the sultans are Muslims, and there were also Christians and Jews as well. It's a very religiously diverse part of the world. 
you know, today that is the case. And thankfully, after Barbara Great, during his rule, instituted a policy of what? Religious tolerance. So religious tolerance was the norm in India, where all these religions coexisted in harmony. They were allowed to be practiced in India. You can be Muslim, you can be Christian, you can be a Hindu in India under Akbar the Great's rule. When the Mughal Empire went in decline, that's when they started becoming stricter and stricter, and that's when they become less tolerant of other religions. All right, Akbar the Great financed, gave land grants to Muslims, Hindus, and Christians alike, so he supported Muslims and Hindus and Christians, gave them land so that they could build their churches. He alleviated tensions between this the majority Hindu population and the Islamic rulers of the Mughal Empire by appointing Hindus into positions of power. So he threw them a bone and allowed them to take part in the Mughal government. However, Akbar the Great did not support every Hindu practice that was going on in India. There were some Hindu practices that he did not agree with, and here are some of the ones that he did not agree with. Number one, the practice of, he banned the practice of child marriages. In Hindu culture at the time, there were a lot of arranged marriages between little girls and full-grown adults, and Akbar the Great was not supportive of that, so he banned that religious practice in India. Another practice that he did not like is self-emulation. Those of you that actually read your notes, what does that mean? In Hindu culture, um, if your husband dies, widows throw themselves in the funeral pyre so they can burn alive with their husbands. That's true love right there. But during um, Akbar's rule, he banned the practice of self-emulation. Now, all of the, even though in hindsight these sound like good ideas to ban, right? These sound like things that definitely should be banned. Back then, he faced a lot of resistance from the Hindu population because this is something that they were accustomed to doing already. All right, I apologize I did not include these on your notes. You need to write this down because it's an important part of your exam. Sikhism is a religion that came out during Akbar's time. So during the Mughal Empire, during Akbar's time, a new religion emerged from Hinduism. So most of the beliefs of Sikhism is, is, is on Hinduism, but it had influence by Islam. What do we call that? Syncretism, when you have Hindu influences and Islamic influences and they combine to produce one religious identity. So we have syncretism between Hindu and Islam. What type of religion is this? From Islam, they borrowed the idea of monotheism. So much of their beliefs are Hindu, but they are monotheistic. They believe in a personal relationship with one God. One of the major beliefs of Sikhism is the recognition of the right for every religion to exist. The recognition of the right for every religion to exist. This is not something that's common at the time in Islam and Christianity. In Christianity, if you're a non-Christian, you're somebody to be converted, right? They might tolerate you, but eventually they want you to convert to Christianity, same thing for Islam. Well, Sikhism are okay with other people practicing their religion, and there's nothing wrong with other people practicing what they believe. What made Sikhism very popular with the Hindu population, especially the lower class Hindu, is the rejection of the Hindu, what? The caste system. So the Hindu hierarchy, the Hindu social hierarchy, this is not something that Sikhism believed in. Remember guys, we have three major religions that came out of India. You got Hinduism, which is still practiced by most Indians today. You have Buddhism, not so much practiced in India today. And Sikhism, Sikhism, if you don't know, I know some of you probably never heard of Sikhism before, but this is the fifth largest religion in the world today. So people that, that wear turbans that look like this, a lot of times, they get mistaken for Muslims, but they're not, they're Sikhs. They're, they have a totally different ideology and they have a totally different religion. All right, let's talk about the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution was a change in science during this time. It grew up alongside of the Renaissance movement. 
I know in English you guys probably talked about the Renaissance before. The Renaissance is a movement in literature and arts. Well, the scientific revolution, just like what it implies, is a revolution, a big change in scientific thinking. Think about the time that this revolution were happening in Europe, right? Where you have religious wars left and right. And people are dying because of the type of Christianity that they believe in. A lot of Europeans, because of the environment at the time, they turn to reason rather than religion or faith. They became disenchanted with religion. They became disenchanted with superstition and instead turned to reason. And this is what the scientific revolution is about. It's about applying reason to science. And one of the most important tenets that we still use today, even in your science classes today, during the scientific revolution, is the idea of empiricism. Empiricism is the idea that before a hypothesis turns into a theory, it needs to have a lot of data supporting it. Using the scientific methods to prove ideas to prove what um, to prove um, and challenge um, traditional ideas. So when you guys do your experiments and stuff like that, that's empiricism, collecting data in order to prove a notion, in order to prove an hypothesis. All right. Some states encourage science, like France and England. They created royal academies of sciences where people study and learn sciences. This matter right here is one of the figures of the scientific revolution. So Isaac Newton of England. Uh, what theory did he come up with? Is who's ever right? Gravity. Very good. The theory of gravity. He also came up with something that some of you are going to hate eventually, which is calculus. All right. The scientific revolution will lead to another movement called the Enlightenment. Hopefully, most of you have heard of it before, especially in middle school years when we're talking about U.S. history, because the ideas from the Enlightenment are the ideas that are eventually going to form the United States of America. The Enlightenment's about this. The scientific revolution says that we have to use reason when it comes to scientific thought. The Enlightenment came out of that, and people try to figure out, why don't we use reason and apply it to government? Why don't we use reason and apply it to human society? Like, for example, the notion of the divine rights of kings. Is that a reasonable notion? Is that backed up by data? Or is it a lie? Those are the ideas that the Enlightenment is going to challenge. All right. You can use your 3.3 notes and the notes that you took today. You did your homework, you can use your homework, or you can, and you can use the notes today for the quiz. The quiz is on Google Classroom. Go ahead and go to Google Classroom. You're not going to get your grade right away. I'll post it by the end of the, period, uh, the day. the assignment on the very top, 3.3, part two, quiz. Once you are done, please turn in your notes, turn in any late work that you need to turn in to me. Then you're done for the day.